Welcome back. Welcome back. So, you see what I said about if we um, put you in a round table, it's much more exciting. Everyone talks to each other. It's amazing. We didn't, it took us 38 seminars to learn that. Um, but that's nice. So, I hope you had a good break. Um, and we're here for the second half now, uh, which is to look initially at the business situations where employee benefits can help. So, this is this research that we did last year. So, um, I'm going to do three things really. What business situations can employee benefits or, re or a new reward and benefit strategy help? Um, talk a little bit about getting cost and value into context. I suspect you know how you have cost and value in context, but what I talk about might help you communicate that to other people, other stakeholders that you have, other people around you in the business. I know that many of you um, will have the have problem of um, wanting to do something but needing to get other people on board uh, before you're able to. Um, and this is quite nice, it's, it's, it's linked a little bit back to what I said earlier on about, about salary budgets. It's a trick that broadly 80 to 90 percent of large employers miss, can't do. Small businesses are much better at doing it. Yeah? I think you've got a slightly um, small business skewed uh, audience today, which is great, so you should be able to do this if you can get your CFO on board. So let's look at this first. This was an online survey we did of our UK client base back in in April last year, um, we did uh, we surveyed about we surveyed people who uh, had, had been live for more than a year because we wanted them to have some sensible results. Um, so we um, had 283 responses from about 700, I think it was at the time, which is about a third. Um, and we did allow people to say when we when we said to them how how effective has the program been, we allowed them to take it's too early to judge if they didn't if for some reason they didn't think they had enough data yet or that they hadn't been live for long enough. So it left us with just 246 responses in the sample. So it's a pretty good sample size. Um, this is what the survey looked like at the time. Uh, it asked what, it's very, very similar to the sheet that you filled out when you got here. In fact, it's the exact same question, the exact same answers. That's why we asked you the same question, because we wanted to see, we wanted to be able to run through what happened in the survey and what you actually think in the room as well. So that's what it looked like. So what were your main, what was your main business drivers for implementing Reward Gateway? Don't forget, these are all clients of ours, so they had implemented Reward Gateway for something, yeah? The options to be seen as an employer of choice, bring existing benefits together and boost engagement, no pay rises, company doing well, low pay review coming, so we want to defocus attention off just cash, cement new values or change culture or to replace a failed provider. This is a bit of a joker in some ways because this option, it masks the original reason for putting the programme in place. If, you have a, if you're replacing a failed provider, a failed program that isn't getting, isn't delivering, you must have actually had an original reason for putting that in place itself. But it is important because some people do, do tick it. So our survey said this. Um, this column is how many put it as their number one choice, and this column is how many had it as their, in, within their top three. Yeah, in their top three. So to be seen as an employer of choice, which is essentially about recruitment and retention, to either improve retention or enable recruitment, was the number one choice for 86 of the 246. Uh, and it was in the top three for more than half. Yeah, for more than half. Bring existing benefits together and boost engagement in them um, was second. That was number one for 41 people. And it was in the top three for nearly half. Had no pay rise for some time, but needed to give something to staff. 31 of our 256 people said that. Uh, and 53 of them, so about a fifth, had it as their top three. This is 2013, so we've been going through the recession in a lot of industries now. Then. The, the flip side of that, the opposite of that, is the company's doing really well. We want to reward staff. And it's interesting, isn't it, how you can use the same product to, in two completely opposite situations. You can use it as a... Hey everyone, it's great. Here's an extra treat. We're really excited to give you this because you've all worked really hard. Or you can use it as, look, we can't. You know, the market's difficult, the industry's difficult. We can't afford pay rises, but we recognise your work doing your very best. It's not your fault. And this is this is something we can do, which has got really modest cost. It will help the money go further. It's interesting how you can use the same product for both. And one of the things that our implementation team does really well, it's really important, is to understand your business reason before they implement a programme. Because actually that's quite important to how we brand it. Because if you're, if you think about it, if you're, if you're in this category here, number three, you probably don't want to brand your programme as Interfleet Perks or Interfleet Surprises. Yeah, because it's kind of, that's more of a treat. 
yeah, more of an extra thing. Whereas if you're, so you might, you might think about some interfleet savers or interfleet, yeah, um, but it's something, something di different. You see how the, the branding choice is quite important depending on what, what you're trying to do. So we're really used to doing that. So it's, um, but it's, really, it's really important for us to understand the reasons why we're putting a program in place. Uh, next one down is low peer review. So we often get a client who put us in place because they've got a low peer review coming, yeah, or they're in the middle of one now. And of course, it's really, it can be really powerful there to say, well, actually, there isn't an awful lot of money on cash, but we've done what we can, and we've got a great new benefit program for you. And often, as we saw with a couple of the case studies earlier on, you've already got some benefits that are going on, but people just don't know about them. And then re-signposting them, re-wrapping them, re-branding them, re-launching them, and putting discounts at the core, which helps people get to them every day and every week, actually can get you a huge amount of value for something you might be already paying for, or certainly have already committed to doing. Yeah. Cement new values or a changed culture. This is interesting. This comes out largely with the reward side. So when you're, if you've got a changed culture or new values, or you want to create, you want to um, create a change in how people think about work. Relaunching your reward and benefits brand, so broadening it out um, using our thank you card uh, products or um, there's, a, there's a manager recognition product as well where managers can send employees a thank you with or without cash. You can configure it however you want. So it can, have no, it can have no cost at all. It can just be thank you. And we brand cards around your values, whatever your, your values are. You can really communicate things with that, you know, a change culture with that. So that's why that gets used. So... That was what we had on the survey. Let's have a look at what we had uh, in the room. So Kate is going to flip us over and see if we have a similar order or a different order. Uh, so want to be an employer of choice is, yeah, it's top for you two. Uh, Twelve of you, that's a lot. Twelve of you put that as your number one choice. Uh, and 18 of you had it in the top three. So recruitment and retention is clearly... Um, it's clearly very much on, your, on many of your minds. Um, bringing benefits together um, to improve engagement in them is get three of you put that as your number one choice and 17 of you put that as in the top three. So again, that's the second one down. No pay rise for some time. Three of you again and nine of you in the top three. So you can see actually, it's all, I think it's actually exactly the same order as here. Again. Which is interesting because that, what that tells us is the results we're going to talk about on screen are very, very relevant to this group because you've actually got you're actually in line with exactly with our with our current client base. Um, okay. Well, let's have a look in a bit of detail. So, to be seen as an employer of choice, so to assist with recruitment and retention, um, who put that in our from our client base? Uh, Thompson, uh, Tui Travel, at that uh, London uh, Underground. Actually, sorry, it's not. It's Transport for London. We've just won London Overground, and I'm getting London over, I'm getting my Overgrounds and Undergrounds uh, mixed up. Transport for London, that is. Uh, Warburton's Bakery. Uh, Yahoo, the internet, uh, internet people. It's interesting, isn't it? Very broad set of, very broad set of um, people. 35% uh, ranked it as their number one choice, 63 as one, two, or three. And the reason why a benefit programme, uh, an integrated reward and benefit programme, is helpful, obviously, is because... With, when you, especially when you've got employee discounts at, at its core, is employee discounts is the, probably the only genuinely universal benefit. It's an interesting benefit, actually, employee discounts. It's not the most valuable benefit. The most valuable benefit in most cases would be your pension. But unfortunately, it has the longest delayed gratification curve in the, in, in the, the known world. You know, a lifetime of pain for a retirement age of pleasure, yeah? which is very difficult to get people to understand when they're young. Yeah, so I, I have a particular problem getting pensions and engagement in Reward Gateway because 80% of my workforce is aged under 30. So pensions, and I was the same, I didn't, I didn't start a pension until I was 36. So I understand that, and you'll have, you know, we'll probably have the same problem ourselves. We'll change with auto-enrolment, which is nice. Employee discounts are very, very universal. Uh, so no matter who you are, you will be shopping and buying services from somewhere. People often say to me things like, oh, you know, Glenn, my workforce is men. <laughs> Congratulations, that's great. You know, half, half of workforces gen generally are, on average, not, uh, not all. They do shop all the time. They do shop, they do things, uh, they'll, uh, they, they might do different things. They might not be responsible for the grocery shopping, uh, but if they're not, then someone must be, someone close to them must be responsible for the grocery shopping, otherwise they're going to be hungry. 
Yeah. So it's, it's just about communications, about getting the message out to the right person in the family who does the grocery shopping. That's all it is. It's not, it's not that they, they live on air. Yeah. So um, universal benefit. And I think the key thing is, um, I think it was Kieran who talked about, uh, is there anything in the benefits programme which is special? Yeah. Whilst employee discounts or a good employee discount programme is becoming more common than it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, it is still, still seen as special. And because it's branded completely to you, it feels like something that you just you've got that other people haven't got. Yeah, so childcare vouchers, you know, it, you know it's a government approved programme and you know that everyone can get it. But, you know, but when you launch Yahoo, the Yahoo Employee Discount Programme that will save Yahoo staff money at House of Fraser and Sainsbury's and Debenhams and ASOS, and especially if we work with you and we, um, we skew the discount proposition, so we skew the retailers to be really appropriate to your workforce. We pick, the re we pick all the retailers and brands that they'd really like, that we think they'd really identify with, and put them all at the top and make them all very visible. When you do that, it feels really, really special. And that's great. And we often talk about it as that wow factor. You know, people don't generally talk to their friends and say, you should come and work here, you get a great pension. They do when they're a bit older, actually, but not, certainly not when they're younger. Um, and people rarely say you should come work for, for Company X. There's some great insured benefits in the Flex programme because they normally can't remember them. I've never ever heard anyone say you should come and work here. We've got a fantastic employee assistance programme. So if you're depressed or an alcoholic <laughs> or you've got no money, then you can call. And no one ever, no one ever says that. But they do say, they do talk about shopping discounts. So whilst it's not going to be the most important benefit from a financial perspective over the course of their life, it's probably the most dramatic one that you can get them to use and, and value every day and week. And I guess usage throughout the year, um, that's the key thing. Keeping a story about um, Thompson's and Next Jump only promoting, uh, uh, only allowing access uh, during uh, two weeks uh, is interesting, actually. Um, I have another client, American Express, who um, for a period ran our programme uh, as a link off a flex programme. And then um, that flex programme went down for four weeks of maintenance between the middle of November and the middle of December, uh, which was obviously Christmas, peak Christmas shopping season, um, which but, you know, wasn't the ideal time to do, to do that. Uh, so we, we, un we unravelled that link with the client. So we asked the question, how, have we met all of your expectations in contributing to the success of that business need or driver? Have we met all of your expectations? And once do we get 89%. So 89% of the clients we surveyed in that said we've met all of their expectations, which is pretty good. If you're thinking as I was, oh, what about the 11% then? What's happened to them? It, it, there, does, there is failure. There is failure. We have to have someone to work with at your side. And when we look at programmes that are struggling, it's nearly always for one, it's nearly always for the exact same reason, which is that the person that bought the programme and installed it has left, and the programme's management from the employer's side has been passed to somebody who actually is probably too busy and they've got other things to do, doesn't really know what to do with it, and it isn't really caught to them. And we can struggle, and we, have, we do have situations like where we can have uh, a client AWOL for a year sometimes, and we can't, you know, if we can't get someone to pick up the phone at the other end, it's really difficult for us to run employee communications. We're actually doing a lot of work on that this year, because we see it as a real issue, because we want every number here to be 100%. And we've got, um, it's just in development right now, we're launching um, before Christmas, a way to run a benefits champions programme, where people in your organisation can pop up as benefits champions, yeah, and help us with communications without needing to go through HR as a single point of, a single point of contact. Um, which actually should, should really help programmes that even when there's a, a management change. <coughs> the next one um, is bring, in, bring existing benefits together and boost their engagement. So many, many, many clients already have a set of employee benefits, benefits that they've collected over several years. Um, and they may be on the intranet somewhere. You know, I often find they're, they're on an HR intranet or they're somewhere, but then you think, OK, so how easy that is that HR intranet to find? How attractive is it? Is it explained really nicely? Can they access it from home? Can they access it from their smartphone at the bus stop or the train station when they're, when they're not at work? And the, the answer is, is nearly always no. So this is um, top for Kulamira Showers Manufacturing, uh, Shelter, the housing charity, uh, Travis Perkins Wicks Retail, uh, Cigna Health Insurance. Uh, so 16% of people said it was their number one issue. Um, 
yeah, intranets aren't great today, yeah? I mean, our, we work hard on our own intranet at Reward Gateway, but our own intranet's nothing like as good as our benefit site that sits in Reward Gateway. So have we met all of your expectations in contributing to the success of that driver? 95% said yes. So you get 95% yes on all expectations. No pay rises for some time, but needed to give something to staff. It's important for nine of you here. Um, so this was number one uh, for Birmingham, Birmingham City Council, just over the road. Derbyshire Fire and Rescue. That is the Civil Aviation Authority in Gatwick. I always get slightly caught out by our cryptic um, photographs of uh, places. Diageo, easier one. Um, so twelve percent ranks it as number one. Twenty-one percent ranks as top three. You know, markets can be tough, and your business or organisation might be struggling financially and not have a lot of money for pay rises or might not have any. It doesn't mean that you don't want to keep your staff on board, and you don't have a real need to keep your staff on board uh, and keep them. Um, engaged for, for the future. I mean, in, when your business is having a tough time, that's exactly the time you do need your staff really, really on board. Um, and I think being able to have an honest dialogue with your workforce and tell them that this is, you know, this is something we can do, which doesn't cost us very much at all, but allows your money to go further, is a real, a real olive branch. It made a huge difference, actually, to Derbyshire Fire and Rescue, um, that, uh, and it actually um, had a key role in repairing some significant industrial uh, employee relations issues that they had. Um, if, you've, if you have that, if you have a, um, a tricky relationship with a unionised workforce um, or, or any workforce, then the Derbyshire Fire and Rescue um, talk is actually on our website as a webinar. You can watch it. Um, cost of living is increasing, we know that. Um, I think especially over the recession, a number of dual income families became single income families or people had reduced hours. So people who were working flexible hours, so zero hours contracts, which had become a uh, um, PR issue this summer, uh, had less hours. So have we met all of your expectations? 90% said yes. So 90% said in, an, in a world of no pay rise, Reward Gateway met all expectations in addressing that, that issue, which is pretty good. Companies doing well, one of the reward staff, so the flip side of that, the exact opposite of that. Um, that was number one for Hastings Direct, insurance company. Um, Rathbones, the wealth management company. Um, Insights, learning and development, um, psychometric test um, business, uh, Gladesmore Community School uh, down in London, uh, and um, Dunlop Goodyear Tyres Manufacturing in the Midlands. Uh, so 10% of our client base had its number one. When you deliver a programme as a perk, as I said earlier on, it, you, can, you make it really exciting. Yeah, you deliver it as a really great perk. So you just, you just, we just change all the communications and, and, use a, and use a different set. It's all about branding communications. And then the, the, the sort of products and things you feature in our communications are different. You know, if you're delivering something as a, we've had no pay rise, we need to make your money further, the retailers that we're featuring are you know, Sainsbury's, Asda, gas, electricity. They're the stuff that you have to buy, yeah? If you're doing this as a perk, depending on what your workforce looks like, you know, you might be doing handbags and shoes. Yeah? So it's always all in the communications. And it's just really, really important that you, that you work with someone who understands that and has got the flexibility to do the exact thing that's right for you now, which might not be right for anybody else. Yeah? Um, have we met all your expectations? 88% said yes. 88%. Implement as part of a low pay review to defocus on just cash. Uh, that was key for Abellio, the bus company, Cummins Engineering up in Middlesbrough, uh, the Royal Albert Hall down in London. Uh, that is Aylesford News and Print Factory. God, it's getting really tested on the, on the uh, things. I'm sure Kate's going to, Kate does the slides, I'm sure at some point Kate will put some really cryptic pictures in that I'll never, I'll never remember. Uh, number one for 7%. Uh, and this is interesting, you know, why, if you think, if you've got, if you've got little money for a peer review, why would you then have, e have even less money by spending some of it on a benefit, your CFO might say to you. Um, and it's because cash is the most expensive way to pay someone. The most expensive way to pay someone. It's the biggest user of your money. You know, to give someone £10, by the time you've grossed it up and put tax in an eye on it, it's probably cost you 15 and it compounds, because if you do a pay rise, you've got to add to it on the, for the following year as well. So in five years' time, you've spent, you know, 150. So it's the most expensive way to pay people. And there are, within some bound, there are some, within, you, know, you, can't go, can, you can't pay people in no cash and all benefits, that doesn't work. But there's a range where you can go where you, there's a part of your employer's money is significantly more effective on employee benefits, as long as they're well run, well communicated, 
and understood and valued. If, if you spend them on benefits that nobody knows and nobody uses, then obviously you've wasted it, yeah? And then, to be honest, that's all about choosing the right, right partner, yeah? Um, it's as simple as that, because you know, I think as you saw from Kieran's Interfleet talk, the devil's in the detail, you know, in both the previous world for Interfleet and the new world, they both had actually largely the same benefits in, and you, know, you can imagine the sales pitch, yeah, yeah, we do all that too, and we've got all that, yeah, we'll link all that, and all things together. But actually, when you really, really get and plot out the journey, you realise it's nearly impossible and it just doesn't happen. Yeah? So the devil is in the detail. Have we met all of your expectations? 100% said yes. 100%. To cement new values or change culture, that was key for Saab Miller, uh, Hobbs, retailer, um, first, uh, first group, rail and travel. Uh, so that's rail and bus. Uh, Grant Thornton, professional service firm, and Gap Retail. And the reason um, a, pr a programme can be really effective there is uh, when, you when you do things like you build a culture and values hub, so we can build a culture and values hub to explain what values you want your staff to exhibit. So if you look at um, our own, um, if you look at our own programme we have internally, we have eight, eight values in Reward Gateway, and our culture and values hub explains what they are, gives examples of behaviour, includes videos of people talking about them, of, of our staff talking about them, and then we have a whole set of e-cards, of thank you cards, you can s we can send to each other with a, a one different value on per card. So one of our values is um, own it, which is about owning something, taking responsibility for it, and making sure that it happens. So if you believe a colleague has really, really shown that value, you can send them a nice thank you card. There's no money attached to it, it's just a really nice thank you, but they really work. You know, I see, I see them printed out and pinned on, on the wall all, all the time at work, which is great. And you can also, you, you can add money to them as well if you want to do that. But also building a benefits brand is a really great marker for your staff to say something's changing, you know, something's changing at work, which is important to us. Yeah, we're not just focusing on other things, we're not just focused. A lot of the work sometimes we do in HR, it doesn't always positively affect the employee in a way that they can see it. I think you know, the biggest example of that might be pensions auto enrolment. I'm sure many of you either have recently completed a large bit of work on pensions auto enrolment, or if you haven't done it, you're about to do it in the middle of it. Yeah? And it will benefit your staff ultimately, because more of them will end up in the pension, and that is a good thing. They won't thank you for it now, particularly. Yeah? So they won't see it as a, oh, yeah, they'll be working themselves into an early grave to do that for us this year. They'll be like, oh, God, now they're taking more money off me. Yeah? Um, and I think when you do things like, you know, when you're doing big projects on grading and things and pay, again, it is for the benefit of your workforce and that, you know, it creates a fairer system, a better system, all, all those things is right, right to do. But it doesn't make your staff often go home in the day saying, I'm really excited about working here. We've got a new grading system. You know, really exciting. Okay, how do we do there? Have we met all your expectations? 100% said yes, again. Um, getting towards the end now, replacing a failed provider. Oh, I was meant to flip the chart, weren't we? Oh, yeah. We were meant to flip the chart with each one and point out who in the room had each, uh, had each thing, but I forgot, sorry. Very polite, Kate, if you're not to mention it. Okay, well, that's not worry about that now. Uh, replacing a failed provider. Uh, who said that? Welcome break. Just left the room actually. They were here. Just heard that their program is going really, really well. Uh, that we, we took them over from uh, a, another company several years ago. Uh, spec savers, um, complex workforce spec savers. Uh, both welcome break and spec savers are complex workforces. So welcome breaks. Got obviously everybody's working in a um, motorway service station. Uh, spec savers has a um, doubly complex workforce. They've got a huge retail chain, and then everyone in head office is um, on the Isle of Man. Oh, sorry, in Guernsey, in Guernsey. Um, and Guernsey has an unusual set of retail stores, um, which we did not normally support, so we had to go and get, ourself, get ourselves around there to support them, so that was really important. D.B. Schenker, um, Rail, and the Northern Trust Company, which is a Canadian um, bank, and Groupon, we run Groupon staff benefits, which I always find, uh, I always find nice. You know, Groupon's fantastic, isn't it? Great um, thing, Groupon. We can't use it every day, otherwise you're, you know, you'd have highlights everywhere and we'd be, you know, brown from a permatan or something like that, you know. <laughs> so uh, Groupon uh, employ us to run their staff benefits programme for all the things um, that their staff need a discount on for the rest of the year. How do we do there? I mean, most of our, cli most of our clients are putting something in place for the first time. Yeah, I'm putting something of this type in place for the first time. But not all, about 20% uh, have tried to do it with somebody else before. 
Um, it's about 20% by value, not quite by number, so slightly less by number. Um, I think you know, there, is, you know, there are a number of um, people who run uh, employee discount programs and employee benefit programs, there are a number of different choices you can have. The devil is in the detail about how it works uh, and, and what their model is. We've always, right from year one, had uh, a completely transparent model um, that's employer paid, has no commission in it, uh, all commission and income we get from retailers goes to your employees. We've got an absolutely clear view of who our client is, it's the HR person, and we have an absolutely clear view of who the, of the customer is, it's the employee, and we know exactly what we're here to do. We're, we're here to support businesses and their relationship with their workforce. We, we use a thousand retailers as a key part of the programme to do that, um, and we're a great partner for those. We are, we are just about every single UK retailer's largest single customer. So we're the largest customer for Sainsbury's, we're the largest customer for Boots, we're the largest customer for House of Fraser, the largest customer for Debenhams, for everybody, yeah, for everybody. We handle more than £80 million pounds worth of Sainsbury's revenue a year. But they're not our client. You're our client. We're really, really clear on that. And a number of other programmes think that the retailer is also the client, so they go running around after the retailers. And the reason we became the biggest channel for retail or the biggest closed group channel for retail in the UK, was about actually ignoring the retailers and focusing on the customer. It was actually everybody else kind of run around and say, what do retailers want? Well, actually, no point in asking the retailers what you want, because if you don't make the customer happy, no one will use it anyway. Yeah? So that's a very, very important difference in our model. And it's something which will never change. We're always obsessively connected to HR. That's why, you know, we run HR seminars. We don't run retail marketing seminars. OK. So many programs end in failure. Normally three years actually takes. It takes normally three years before a company accepts they've put the wrong partner in place and moves somebody else. At least three years. It can take longer because it's a big thing. You know, you think about, you're all, you're all at some point, I presume, on the benefits journey now, uh, doing research and things, and you do procurement, you'll get people on board, you put some in place. If in nine months' time you're thinking, oh my God, that's not the right one, I'm honest, the majority of you won't fix it. You'll wait until you've moved to a different job and let someone else fix it afterwards. That's what normally happens. You can see, you can see that in, our, in, all of our, in all of our moves. Um, because it's a big deal. There'll be something else you've got to do next year. There'll be something else. There'll be another, you know, how much time can you spend as an HR person on this particular area? There'll be something else you have to do. So generally, uh, you, if, you, if you get it wrong, you, you're, you're losing about three to four years of your reward impact. 100% said yes. Um, we are, we, you'll see later on actually, um, on all of our customer satisfaction scores, we're obsessed about feedback, as you've probably picked up from the tone of the seminar. Um, on all customer satisfaction scores, uh, our ratings go off the scale for a client who's had a previous provider because they have contacts and they've seen something before. They're in, in sales, they're known uh, as the easiest or hardest people to sell to. And the reason they could be either is because they either have seen what bad looks like, therefore when they see good, they think, oh my God, I completely see that now, so I see it really clearly. That's fantastic, yeah? Or they're so burned by the disaster of the last three years, they don't believe that anybody can make a good hash of it. So they can, it, can, it, pol it polarises. So that's kind of where we end up. So if you kind of look at that kind of success, and it's important, the question was about, you know, did we meet all of your objectives? Um, it's a pretty strong, pretty strong service set. So that's kind of my section on thinking of business drivers, what you're trying to do and how effective is a programme like this. The next bit, which is a lot shorter, that I just wanted to talk about, was about getting price and value in context. Because as several people have said today, you know, everything's got a price. So I just wanted to look at some numbers. Um, I've assumed uh, a thousand employees, which is probably nobody in the room. I bet you're all more or less than that. But the maths is easy, and I'm not an accountant. Yeah, so easy maths. If you had a thousand people and you paid them an average of twenty thousand pounds a year and a bit of NI and tax, uh, it's a bit of NI. Sorry, you're looking at about twenty-three point eight million pounds in my. I call it CEO's maths. It's right to the nearest ten percent. A low-cost healthcare cash plan. So a healthcare cash plan. Uh, Pays you, gives you essentially a subsidy against dentists and, dentists and, and the opticians. If you bought that for your employees, it would cost you about 84k. Yeah, there's a range of ones you can get, but about that, 84 pounds per employee. An employee assistance program. 
Um, a low cost one, probably about 10k you could get for, yeah. So occasionally cheaper, but you, you get what you pay for, the lower the cost, the less services there'll be, the higher your cost, the more services there'll be, you'll get things like counselling and stuff, uh, on-site counselling. Um, it's an interesting EAP. I actually don't believe EAP is, a, is an employee benefit. It's not. It's nearly always called an employee benefit, and it appears in Employee Benefits magazine, and people think it is. And it's funny, the last time I ran this um, session, somebody in the room was from an EAP provider, and she came to see me at the end, I thought it was going to be in trouble. She said, no, you're completely right. She said, I don't know why we sell it as an employee benefit, because it's not, it's a corporate service. Now, I would never, I would never run a business without an EAP. Never because I've had a number of situations uh, in the last seven years when I've been absolutely d uh, saved by our EAP provider, yeah? With staff who've either had a really difficult medical situation uh, or a really difficult mental health situation. But an EAP is a corporate insurance. It's the, it's the, per you know, it's the, it's the people that you, your managers call when they're faced with a personal staff issue that they really need to handle. No one goes home to their wife, girlfriend, husband or boyfriend and says, fantastic day at work today. We've got this new thing called an EAP where I can ring them if we run out of money or if you leave me. Yeah, and it's not a benefit to them. It's a benefit to you as an employer because then you, haven't, you have support in dealing with those difficult times. <coughs> the Christmas party, uh, researched by SAGE, the payroll people, financial people, uh, is that 84% um, uh, of British businesses pay for their staff Christmas party. The average amount paid is £36 per employee. I think the maximum you can pay is 150 I think, from HMRC rules. Ours, the Reward Gateway Christmas party, absolutely tips the very edge of the HMRC uh, limit, I'm certain. Pension, if you were, if you were um, contributing 2% per employee, would be 400k, nearly half a million. Uh, medical insurance, PMI, if you bought that for your workforce, obviously it depends on, on what your demographics like and how old they are. There's no point in buying PMI if they're young. I learned that. That was my very, very first benefits uh, lesson, where about 10 years ago I was running a design and marketing agency and we would had a good quarter, which is a miracle in a design and marketing agency because you never give a good quarter. And I, I bought all 25 of my staff um, PMI uh, for a couple of hundred quid per person because they were all 20, age 23 or 24. And I realised that I, that was my first lesson in uh, age-appropriate benefits. Because obviously when you're 23, you don't think you're ever going to get ill, so you have no interest in PMI. I didn't know that then. Permanent health insurance keeps paying your salary if you're off sick from work. Uh, £100,000 per, empl uh, uh, per employee that might cost. Tea and coffee. Many of you might provide tea and coffee for your staff. I think it's 60% who do, depending on how you do it. Uh, the average is 20p per employee per day. UK average. Employee discounts, a really well-run employee discount programme might cost you 36k, something like that, depending on what you have, how it's configured, what sort of business you are. So when you look at that and you think, right, you know, what benefit does the business get from these things? Well, we've got to pay a salary, we know that. Christmas parties, you know, great. Don't cancel a Christmas party if you can help it, yeah? But it only touches your workforce once a year yeah, normally leaves them with a hangover, yeah, and actually it's quite difficult to get it really right, it's quite difficult for you to go, that's an amazing party. Often it's somewhere in between, yeah, the food ran out at nine o'clock and the drinks were, were been to right, but it's quite expensive actually, often. Pensions are really expensive, but you've got to do it now. PMI, uh, very niche, really, it is really, really niche, only a small number of businesses would provide that, organisation would provide that. But you really, you know, tea and coffee is expected, often. But when you look at, you're looking at a benefit you can put in place that will create that wow factor regularly, make people think, oh, this is quite special, and you can make it so much about you and about your workforce. You can tailor it so much. It's, um, it's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest ROI you're going to get. And I think this is the, the ultimate, you know, why perks and benefits work generally. Like I said before, salary is the most expensive way to reward people. Absolutely. Giving someone £10 cash is going to cost you 15 If you only pay your employees in cash, you're wasting money. You're, you're paying them in the most expensive way possible. So people say to me, oh God, Glenn, I've got this crusty CFO. What am I going to do? What can I say to them? If I've got a CFO in the lift and I've got 15 seconds, I just say, look, mate, you're wasting an awful lot of money because you're paying your staff in the most expensive way you can find. That's it. That's the first thing to get across. If you haven't got an employee discount program and a great employee benefit program in place, you're paying your staff in the most expensive way you possibly can. 
effective perks and benefits. So the word effective is incredibly important. Yeah. Effective perks and benefits amplify employer money. They make it bigger. Cash in salary makes it smaller. 50, you know, ten pounds becomes seven after tax and I. Fifteen pounds becomes ten. Yeah. An effective benefit costs the business less to implement than the employer perceive, the employee perceives it as worth. That's absolutely the heat, the whole point. There are only a couple of reasons why you would ever consider putting an employee benefit in place. This is the most this is the most common one, the financial reason. Yeah. Ninety percent of benefits uh, no, sorry, 70-80% benefits will get put in place on this reason or should be. Yeah? The other key reason is cultural. Yeah? So you, you, know, you, provide, you might provide discounted or subsidised gym membership because you want, to, you want to start to influence your culture to be more about health and wellbeing and you're worried about your health. You want to show, you want to show that you're supporting that side of things. Yeah? If you're Google or you're a tech company on the West Coast, you know, you're, you're putting in perks and benefits because you... You, you need to really show that you're fun and all that kind of stuff. It's a real cultural piece about showing that you're the right sort of employer. Yeah? But for the majority of businesses, the majority of organisations, this is the key thing. It's because it makes good business sense. It's the same thing about employee engagement. And our other seminar talk is all about employee engagement and culture. You know, why is employee engagement important? Because it makes business sense. It makes your bottom line better. That's why. It's not something that you don't, you don't make a lot of money and then say, I'll spend some of it on employee engagement because that'll make the day more fun. You invest in employee communications and employee engagement and your culture because it will make you a better business and there'll be more money on the bottom line at the end of it. If there's not, then don't do it. And people sometimes ask me for the evidence. And there's loads of evidence. When I look at the, I get to see all the Benefits Excellence Award submissions after the awards have been done. And many of our clients are able to show impact and engagement through their, their own engagement studies. But I think really, you know, do you just think about it? There's two businesses that you could work for or that you could own or that you could run. One of them has a highly engaged workforce that loves coming to work, knows exactly what they're doing, thinks the business is great, believes in the brand, believes in the product and wants to do great work for their clients. The other one is the opposite of that. They're miserable, unhappy, just do the job, do the hours, and then they get out. Which one do you want to own, manage, run, lead, or be part of? Clearly the first one. And I don't need a university professor to run a PhD study to tell me that business is going to be more successful. And it's the same with this. So really our message to CFO is always this. If you're 100% focused on your bottom line, if you're absolutely obsessed by cost, and if you're looking to squeeze every penny out of your business, then you should implement a proper effective employee benefit programme because it will cost, create more value for your employees than it costs for you as an employer. Andy Smith, who's a CFO, said from one employee discounts, it's like having retailers pay part of your salary bill. It's like having retailers pay part of your salary bill. And you think, if you think about it, who loses out? To be honest, it's actually advertising companies that lose out because that's essentially where the money would have gone, really. Because what you have with an employee discount programme is the retailer's customer acquisition money and advertising money is essentially diverted to us and then we divert it to the employee the benefit. And the trick, last bit, the trick. So what is it that small companies are better at doing, more able to do than big? It's this. Back to our thousand staff example, thousand staff, 20k average salary, 20 million pay bill, I've not added the NI this time. Let's imagine you were going to give a 2% pay rise this year. Is that reasonable, 2% this year? Or who's thinking about pay rise this year? Put your hand up if you think 2% is about right for this year. Couple. Yeah, okay, most of you. Too high? Who thinks it's too high? Too low? Okay, so it's okay, so it's 2% or more. Okay, well, you can make the numbers even bigger then. I wrote this in 2013, you see. It was a much, it was a much more unhappy place than 2013. We've moved on. Um, okay, 2% pay rise is going to cost you nearly half a million pounds. Yeah? Because 2% of 20, 20 million is 400k. 1,000 staff, that means every person is going to get £400 extra on average. Uh, which, after paying tax and national insurance, is worth £264 per year to them. Yeah? So it's £22 a month. So they're going to go home and say to their wife, girlfriend, husband, boyfriend, neighbour, dog, cat, whatever, work really hard all year, we work really hard all year, company's doing alright, recession's over, I've got £22 a month more. 
put in place a pay rise and reward gateway. And let's imagine reward gateway cost you 40k. Then you only have 360,000 pounds left for your pay rise, yeah? Which is 360 pounds per person. Which actually attracts less tax than I, so you end up with 20 pounds they get cash per month extra. But they get all of this. So really, you, you're faced with a choice of pay review. For the same amount of money, do you want to send your staff home, A, with £22 a month, that's it, or B, with £20 a month and a brand new employee benefit programme, fully branded, fully conned, all the benefits in one place, discounts on all your shopping, all the services and everything, all together. And the point I would make is this will always feel better and bigger to your employees than this will. And it's all because of effective employee benefits amplify money and cash decreases it. But like we said many times, employee benefits are only cost effective if they're well understood and well used. And that's the big thing, that's the kind of elephant in the room always, is will they get well used? And you know, you saw three case studies today, two from clients who already have your walking in place for, 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 um, for a long time, uh, and one from interview are putting it in place. Um, showing how, uh, how much we work to make sure that staff understand and, have, and understand and know the benefits are there. And I wanted to pick up on just two other parts of making something effective. So there are three things that make a programme effective. Yeah? The first is how well we engage with your workforce, how well we do communications, how much outreach we do and how much we really get under the skin of that. So that's about knowing where your sites are, what they're like, who works at each site, who could be a champion at each site, what, you know, all that stuff about you know, where they're going shopping. And it's not the same for, it's not the same for all parts of your company, perhaps. You know, you'll have people in different parts of the UK, maybe, people in different jobs, people in different roles. That's the engagement side. The product itself has to be incredibly easy and intuitive to use. And this is our product development team. It's a third of our, it's a third of our workforce. 57 people work in product development. And all they're doing all the time is obsessing about making it easier more intuitive, better. They work really closely with the help desk team, looking at when people ring us up, because actually most calls are preventable, and every time someone rings up they get great service, but actually, like, oh, we wish, we, we wish they hadn't, didn't have to ring us up, we wish they could have just done it themselves. So we're always working on that, and we compare ourselves with absolutely the best in consumer and e-commerce. They put a software release live every single Wednesday morning. So every single Wednesday you could ring our London office at 5.30 in the morning, you'd find six members of the product team at work putting the release live because 5.30 in the morning is the quietest time, best time to put live. And this is the employee savings team. This is the third part. The people who help your employees when they're stuck or when they need advice. It's not always stuck. They just want, sometimes they just want to talk and ask about something. So this is Sophia who runs this. And she runs a team of 20 people supporting employees across all of our clients. Those three things uh, result in what is essentially the highest customer satisfaction score in our industry. Has anyone, anyone heard of Net Promoter Score, NPS? Some of you nodding heads? It's a customer satisfaction uh, metric, yeah? It's, uh, we like it because it's really simple and it's also quite ambitious, it's hard. You ask, your, uh, you ask your clients on a scale of 0 to 10, it's always an 11 point scale, how likely would you be to re recommend Reward Gateway to a friend or colleague? Just one, it's, it's actually two questions. It's that question followed by what could we do to move you closer to a 10 or keep you at a 10, yeah? So it's quite tough. It's critics say it's too hard because what you do is you take the percentage of people who've made you a nine or a 10, you ignore the sevens and the eights, you take the percentage of people who uh, put six or less and you deduct this number from this number. So to get a plus up, we have to get a nine or a 10 but anything less than six gets us a minus, and seven it gets us nothing at all. So it's tough. Because many people say, oh, I think you're great, but I'm, a, you know, I'm not a high scorer. It's as far as I go, yeah? But that's not, you know, that doesn't count as a plus for us. But we like it, because it's tough, and we want to be measured against the toughest standards. So, that's how the maths works. Uh, because you can actually, um, you could have more people as a detractor than a promoter, you, it's an, it can have a negative. So NPS ranges from minus 100, to plus 100. That's why it's not actually a percent. It often gets written as percent, but it's not. Because it's minus 100 to, to plus 100. And there are some entire industries that are all negative. So there are some industries in the world where the highest performing NPS company is minus 30. Because generally it's customers, that, that industry really struggles with its customer base. 
Um, so I wanted to give you a bit of a benchmark because we tagged to the end of the survey that we've been running through here. We tagged NPS to the end of it. We now run NPS every quarter with our clients. So here's some um, um, some benchmarks. It's an odd set of companies. I just had to use you know, whoever's not everyone publicly puts their net promoter score out because it's obviously it can be sensitive. But a number of companies do. So Simply Health do the cash one provider. They're plus twenty nine. Bupa plus seven. Pru Health minus nine. Virgin Media plus sixteen. Sky plus fifteen. AOL minus six, Expedia minus ten. Interestingly, the travel uh, online travel industry is entirely negative NPS. I'm not sure why, um, but everyone everyone is negative. Um, O2 mobile network plus 24, Apple plus 66, First Direct plus 62. Sorry, there's a stink there. Adobe plus 48, Direct Line plus 20, Reward Gateway is plus 43. But there's one here which is higher than everyone on the chart. It's higher than Apple, and it's higher than First Direct. And it's uh, plus 76, and it's reward gateway for people who've used a previous provider before. It's us when you segment to just the people who've used another program, which is really interesting, isn't it? So that's what I wanted to say, really. Um, this is my About Me page, so if there's anything I've said that's interesting you want to talk about it more, you can go to about.me slash Glenn Elliott, and there's a link there to my blog, which looks like this. Uh, so we have a blog on rewardgateway.com, and I have a personal blog where I talk about whatever I think might be, might be interesting. Um, there's loads of really great stuff. If anything you've seen uh, today has interested you, inspired you, or you think you'd like to know more, the, the richest place we have for more is our blog, uh, which is on our main website. Just go to rewardgateway.com and hit blog. Um, it, we only launched it recently. It's amazing. We have uh, 18 of our employees writing blog articles uh, from all different aspects of the business about um, ideas, things they've done with clients, all sorts of It's some really, really great stuff. So you, know, you, you might well find uh, additional stuff there that you'd, um, that you'd like that will help. Will help. Um, obviously, it's all free, and we'd just love you to use it. Uh, and the other thing is, if you are um, responsible for or interested in health and well-being or employee health and well-being in any way, um, we've got a really special event on the 26th of July in London. So there's a big sea change coming in technology to do with well-being, uh, and it will impact the corporate health and well-being market um, significantly. It's a really, really exciting time. Um, this is not a product launch or, or a sales pitch or anything like that. This is us uh, foreseeing that there's a big sea change coming in corporate health and wellbeing. Uh, what we've done is we've got together um, some of the leading experts from wearables, trackables uh, and devices yeah, to um, give us, lend us, share with us some of their new products that aren't even launched yet. And they're coming to the event and we're doing a whole showcase on it and we've got some um, some, uh, some of the employers that are really at the forefront of looking at health and well-being are coming to share just where they're at. So it's a couple of hours in the morning, it's on a Friday uh, on the 26th of July. And if you're, so if you're interested in health and well-being, some of you I know have been talking in the break there have got an ageing workforce. One of the um, people that's helped us very, very much uh, with setting it up is a large employer who didn't recruit for, probably didn't recruit for 10 years. Uh, so they had a blip, so they have this, this blip in their, in their whole age profile, they have a big engineering outfit, and they, they have an ageing set of engineers with who they have to keep working because they haven't got young ones with the experience. So for them, health and wellbeing is business critical because they have to keep their ageing workforce at work healthy and well. Um, and some of you may also have that or you may have other reasons. So just let, let, and let your reward gateway contact know if you'd like to come um, to that event because we'd love to see you there. Oh, this is it. Yeah, I forgot there's a flyer. Well, it's called Wellbeing 2015. Wellbeing 2015. Um, and that's it. Uh, I'm um, really grateful for your time coming. I hope it's been helpful. So we'll leave it there. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.